Good afternoon. My name is Kim Stanger. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. Today we're going to be talking about fair market value and healthcare transactions. And a special welcome to my friend and colleague Keith Pinkerton. Keith is a business appraiser, and I work with him on uh, worked with him for several several occasions, several transactions over the years. Uh, Keith is not only a great valuator from my perspective in working with um, healthcare providers, but you should know that Keith has also been retained as an expert to uh, represent the government in various uh, transactions when they're looking at Stark and anti-kickback issues. So he has a unique perspective from both sides of the fence on this one. I have been on the dark side. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to be talking about fair market value in transactions. So I'm going to cover kind of the, the legal aspects, and then I'm going to turn it over to Keith, and Keith's going to give you some practical advice from a business valuator's perspective. Uh, in the materials that we provided to you, you should have received an email that has the PowerPoint presentations along with uh, some other written materials that um, I think are helpful in, from the OIG discussing fair market value issues. If for some reason you didn't get those, just shoot me an email. We'll make sure that we get those out to you. Our presentation today is going to be recorded, and because of that, we're going to take the questions offline. So if you have questions for either Keith or, or me as we go along, you can submit them using the chat feature, and we'll respond offline, or you can shoot just either of us an email and we'll go ahead and respond offline. With that said, let's talk a little bit about fair market value. General rule is, hey, you got to pay uh, fair market value for whatever uh, you're getting in the healthcare context. That means the price has to equate with value. The problem in the in the healthcare context is we have unique standards for determining what is or what is not fair market value. Um, we're going to talk today primarily about the IRS rules and the fraud and abuse laws. The IRS is pretty standard, but the fraud and abuse laws have some specific requirements for determining fair market value. Let's talk about the 501c3 issues first, just to get those out of the way. If you are a tax-exempt entity, a 501c3 or 501c4, you have to be worried about a situation in which you are providing private benefit to third parties. The whole concept behind a 501c3 is you're operating for community benefit, not to benefit individuals. So if you are paying individuals more than fair market value, you may have a problem with potential uh, private annulment or private benefit situations. That could, if it's very bad, it could result in loss of tax exempt status. That doesn't occur very often. Instead, the government imposed these intermediate sanctions if uh, insiders or others are paid excessive economic benefits. And excess, according to the IRS guide, excess benefit occurs when the value of the benefit provided by the organization exceeds the value of the services rendered. Fair market value is the benchmark used in determining value. That's kind of the standard appraiser test. No real surprises there. Uh, just a comment. Under the intermediate sanctions rule, under the IRS, if you're trying to determine fair market value, what you want to pay for a particular service or item, there is this intermediate sanction rule that creates a rebuttable presumption of fair market value so long as you jump through certain hoops. You're presumed to, or that valuation is presumed to be reflect fair market value. It has to involve a disinterested board or committee review of the transaction before it's finalized to evaluate the fair market value. That review is based on comparable data typically generated by an outside party like a valuation consultant like Keith. Yeah. Or board, the, the, the board bases its determination on that comparable data and the decisions are documented in minutes, including the rationale that supports the value higher than the consultant they have generated. So this is not a panacea. Um, you, it, it, is, it creates a rebuttable presumption, so somebody could come in there and rebut that, but at least you have that in your favor if you jump through those hoops in coming up with your fair market value. All right, we're going to turn now to the bigger issue that, I, that we deal with most often, and that's the fraud and abuse laws. Um, the government's concerned about referral relationships between, or financial relationships between potential referral sources because it may skew medical decision making and it may uh, result in increased cost of Medicare or Medicaid program. As a result, the government has broad abuse laws like Stark and the Anti Kickback Statute that crack down on transactions that uh, create a potential for fraud and abuse. 
Uh, some of those transactions that implicate fair market value concerns are employment contracts, services contracts, any third-party independent contractor agreement with potential referral sources like agreements to provide clinical services, medical directorships, call coverage agreements, management services agreement, IT support, anything else where you're paying a referral source or getting paid by a referral source to provide services. Uh, leases for space or equipment or timeshares, practice uh, the sale of a physician practice or sell of items or services, practice support or subsidies, joint ventures, whatever the situation is, most of the time in order to comply with those regulations, you've got to make sure that you're paying fair market value for whatever it is you're acquiring or for what you're contracting with. To the extent you're paying over fair market value, then the inference may be that you're paying in order to get referrals rather than actually for that service. Could work the other way. Maybe you're paying less than fair market value. Maybe that person is giving you this service at less than fair market value in order to generate your referrals. And so it's that overage or underage is where there's a problem because in those situations it could be interpreted as a payment in order to induce referrals which could trigger the Stark and the anti-kickback statute. Lots of recent cases, big cases, tens of millions of dollars where hospitals or other uh, healthcare providers have had to repay tens of millions of dollars to the government because of situations where physician contracts were paid more than fair market value. So it is critical to make sure that you're payments are, are within the, the fair market value range. Note that uh, more recently the government has been turning not only to collecting against the hospital or the entity that uh, received improper payments, but also going after CEOs of the C-suite personnel who were involved in those deals. For example, in the Toomey case, uh, to me, the, the hospital actually had to pay about $74 million back because the government concluded that they paid more than fair market value for services provided by uh, physicians. But not only that, they went against the CEO who had to pay a million dollars back out of his own pocket because of those violations. So you who are working in the C-suite, you need to make sure that you are complying with these rules because the government may come knocking on your door to get some of that money back. All right, let's talk about some of the laws and how they apply. The first and most important law that you always need to be concerned about is the False Claims Act, which says that you can't knowingly submit a false claim for payment to the federal government. Now, a false claim is defined to include not only a claim that you know wasn't accurate when you submitted it, but if you are also not complying with the rules governing that claim, including the Stark or the anti-kickback statute or the civil monetary penalties law. Therefore, if you have a violation of Stark, the AKS, or the civil monetary penalties law, then that can create a false claim which requires an overpayment. And if you fail to make that report and repayment within 60 days, you can get hit up with a whole bunch of penalties. Those were just uh, last year, those were increased from $5,500 per claim that was submitted to $11,000 to $22,000 per claim. In addition, under the False Claims Act, you're going to have to do the repayment to get those civil monetary penalties. You can get hit up with treble damages, and you can also be excluded from Medicare or Medicaid. Now, again, the False Claims Act can apply when you violate the civil monetary penalties law, start with the anti-kickback statute. Well, what do they require? Well, the civil monetary penalties law it doesn't come up all that often in the context of fair market value, but it could. The civil monetary penalties law, among other things, says you cannot offer or transfer remuneration to a Medicare or a state program beneficiary, like your patients, if you know or should know that the remuneration is likely to influence the beneficiary to order or receive items or services payable by federal or state programs from a particular provider. So you can't be giving your patients freebies in order to get them to come to you. Remuneration is specifically defined as the transfer of items or services for less than fair market value. So if you're giving patients freebies less than fair market value, then that could potentially result in a CMPL violation unless you can structure the deal to fit within one of the regulatory safe harbors. Now there are exceptions, safe harbors that would apply to providing certain benefits at less than fair market value, but you need to structure the deal to fit within those safe harbors. I should note that if you've got a civil monetary penalties law violation, you've probably also got an anti-kickback violation, which brings us to the anti-kickback statute. The anti-kickback statute, this is the one we are really most concerned about when we're talking about fair market value issues. The anti-kickback statute says that you cannot knowingly and willfully offer, pay, solicit, or receive remuneration 
to induce referrals for items or services covered by government programs unless you've structured that deal to fit within a regulatory safe harbor. So if you're giving sweetheart deals less or more than fair market value for certain services, that could trigger the anti-kickback statutes. What are the penalties? Hey, this is a felony, folks. You go to jail for this one. The criminal penalties are up to five years in prison and a $25,000 fine. The civil penalties were just increased from $50,000 per violation up to $73,600 per violation. Plus, you can get hit up with trouble damages. It's also an anti-kickback violation is an automatic False Claims Act violation, so you're also subject to all those penalties under the False Claims Act, and you can be, it's automatic exclusion from Medicare and Medicaid. So the key is you want to make sure that you structure your deal to fit within a regulatory safe harbor or otherwise document that there's no risk of fraud and abuse. Now, the anti-kickback statute is an intent-based statute, so it's not essential that you fit within a safe harbor, but if you don't fit within a safe harbor, the test is, is one purpose of that payment above fair market value in order to induce referrals. Now, that's a hard, sta that's a hard standard to defend against. So you don't want to go there if you can avoid it. All right, that's the anti-kickback statute. Its evil twin is the Ethics and Patient Referrals Act, or more commonly known as Stark, after Representative P. Stark, who sponsored this bill. Stark says that if a physician or a member of the physician's family has a financial relationship with another entity, that physician cannot make referrals to that entity for certain designated health services payable by Medicare, and if they do make an improper referral, that other entity, like the hospital or another physician practice, can't bill the government for those services that were uh, provided pursuant to a prohibited referral unless you structure the deal to fit within a regulatory safe harbor. Unlike the anti-kickback statute, Stark is a strict liability statute. You either comply or you don't comply. You need to structure your deal to fit within a safe harbor if you have this financial re relationship with a uh, physician and that physician is going to be making referrals for designated health services. What are the penalties? Well, again, repayment of the amounts by Medicare or Medicaid, you can get hit up with civil fines if you fail to repay within a certain period of time. You can get hit up with a uh, circumvention scheme. I think that the penalties for that were just increased from $100,000 to, I think it's right around 130000 if I remember right. In addition, you're going to have False Claims Act liability. That means that all of those penalties for false claims can, can come back and haunt you on this. Well, where does um, fair market value fit into all of this? Well, the key to Stark and the anti-kickback statute's compliance is to structure your deal to fit within regulatory safe harbors. And fair market value is one of the common requirements for those, fair mar for those um, safe harbors. Let's talk about those safe harbors. The government said that because many exceptions to the Stark law require fair market value compensation for items or services actually needed and rendered, hospitals and presumably other healthcare providers should have appropriate processes for making and documenting reasonable, consistent, and objective determinations of fair market value and for ensuring that the needed services and items are furnished or and rendered. Uh, so, in the employment context, Stark and the anti-kickback statute both have safe harbors applicable to employment contracts if you're employing a physician for purposes of Stark. Remember, Stark only applies to physicians or members of the physician's family. Anti-kickback statute is broader. It applies to everybody. If you've got an employment contract with a physician or a member of the physician's family, among other things, that compensation has to be consistent with fair market value and it has to be commercially reasonable. And that compensation structure can take into effect the, the uh, account the volume or value of referrals. Okay, that's what you need to do to fit within Stark for your employment contracts with your physicians. To comply with the anti-kickback statute, it's actually very broad. It basically says that compensation paid to bona fide employees for furnishing items or services payable by Medicare or Medicaid that that fits within the exception. Note that there is no express fair market value requirement under the anti-kickback statute for employment contracts. However. In an OIG letter, they did raise the possibility that if you are making excess payments for referrals instead of, uh, that if you are paying excess amounts to uh, physicians or other referral sources under employment contracts, 
then they may they reserve the right to come in there and say, well, those that compensation is being paid for referrals, not for legitimate services, and therefore there is the possibility that the government could come after you, even under the anti-kickback statute, if you're overpaying in employment contracts. I haven't seen any of those actually come down that way, but there's a possibility that it might come out that way. Those are employment contracts. What about independent contractor relationships? Well, Stark has a safe harbor in order to comply with Stark, among other things. Again, the compensation has to be consistent with fair market value, can't take into account the volume of value of services or other business generated by the parties, and the arrangement has to be commercially reasonable. Under the anti-kickback statute, similarly, and it, the aggregate compensation has to be consistent with fair market value, and again, it has to be commercially reasonable. All right, so what is fair market value under Stark? Stark has a specific definition for fair market value. In, in 42 CFR 411.351, it states that fair market value in the context of a services contract means the compensation that would be included in a service agreement as the result of bona fide bargaining between well-informed parties to the agreement, ah, and here's the kicker, who are not otherwise in a position to generate business for the other party. So you've got to take out, you've got to back out the compensation for that you would otherwise pay because they're in a referral source. You've got to look at what they're doing, not necessarily pay them for other referrals. Usually fair market value is the compensation that has been included in bona fide service arrangements with comparable terms at the time of the agreement where the compensation has not been determined in any manner that tracks, takes into account the volume or value of anticipated or actual referrals. If you're working with evaluation consultant, you need to make sure that they understand this is a different standard than under the IRS or most valuation situations. That the fact that you can't take into account those referral streams when you're establishing fair market value for services contracts. Well, what about the anti-kickback statute? The anti-kickback statute doesn't have a specific exception or, or definition for fair market value in the employment context. In the services contract, they basically said that it has to be an arm's length transaction that's not determined in a manner that takes into account the volume of value of referrals. But in that 1992 letter from the OIG, they make this comment that in determining the fair market value of services rendered by an employer or contract physicians, it may be necessary to exclude from consideration any amounts which reflect or relate to past or future referrals or any amounts which reflect or are affected by the expectation or guarantee of a certain volume of business by either the physician or the hospital. So similar to the to the Stark standards, you gotta kind of back out and not take into account the volume of value of those referrals. The government emphasized this in 2015 where they actually issued a fraud alert uh, warning people against physician compensation arrangements in medical directorships or other arrangements where they were overpaying those physicians presumably because of referral streams. Among other things, they emphasized that you need to ensure that your arrangements reflect fair market value for bona fide services the physicians actually provide. That's bona fide services, that's not necessarily providing referrals. Well. What are some factors that you might take into consideration then? I think Keith will get into more of this just real quickly. Um, certainly some factors you might consider are comparable compensation for similarly situated providers in your region under MGMA or other published surveys. MGMA seems to be the most common that, that people use. But make sure that you're comparing apples to apples in that situation. That can depend on the, the provider's productivity, the particular region that you're at. Sometimes people will cite MGMA numbers when really when you look at it, those numbers have nothing to do or are unrelated to the specific services that that physician's provided. You should also consider the physician's the, the provider's compensation before becoming employed. If there's a marked increase that's not justifiable, that's a red flag. The services that are actually provided by the provider, the services that are actually required by the employer, you don't want to be paying for services that you really don't need. That could violate either fair market value or the commercially reasonable test that we're going to talk about. The provider's specialty, their experience, their past or anticipated personal productivity, what they're personally going to do, not their referral stream. Past attempts to recruit the provider to the community, you may need to pay a provider more to get them into your area. And if you can show that you tried to pay them less and you couldn't get a provider there, hey, that's a factor you can consider. Market demand, community need, other situations. Um, when you're evaluating that, make sure, especially when it comes to compensation, that you're looking at the overall compensation that you're paying to that provider. That's salary, bonuses, benefits pensions, deferred compensation, insurance, any of the benefits that you're providing needs to go into that, that calculation for compensation. 
ensure that the compensation correlates to the actual services performed. Some people will say, well, we're still okay because we're paying 75% of MGMA, but if the physician's only producing at 10% of MGMA, that's a problem. Monitor the performance over the term of the contract. And maybe you started out okay, but the physician's productivity has reached a point that it's no longer fair market value. Uh, how do you go ahead and document? What are some of the common valuation methods? What I normally see is, you know, everybody seems to like to rely on the MGMA, but again, you got to be a little bit careful about that and make sure it's really valid under your particular circumstances. You could also look to compensation paid to similar providers in the area, but make sure that you're not you're relying on appropriate ones and not <laughs> compensation structures that were improper because they're taking into account the volume of value of referrals. Or you could check with an outside valuation firm. All right, what about uh, situations where you're talking about the purchase or sell of a particular item? Could be purchase or sell of a practice or other item or service. Stark has a specific exception, the isolated, serv uh, isolated transaction exception that says that you can fit within that safe harbor. Among other things, you've got to make sure you're paying fair market value, that the price you're paying is not based on the volume of value of referrals, and it's commercially reasonable even if there were no referrals. The anti-kickback statute doesn't have a similar safe harbor, but presumably the same types of uh, considerations would apply. Well, what about payments by a physician? Stark has a specific safe harbor that applies to if a physician's going to go ahead and pay for a service or item, generally the compensation has to be fair market value. When we're talking about a purchase or sell situation, Stark's definition of fair market value, again, says, that that is the value in an arm's length transaction is consistent with general market value. And they define general market value as the price that an asset would bring as the result of bona fide bargaining between well-informed buyers and sellers who are not otherwise in a position to generate business for the other party. There's the kicker. That's the, the thing that you need to be careful of when you're doing practice evaluations of those things, that you're backing out or not taking into account the volume of value of referrals. Usually the fair market price is the price at which bona fide sales have been consummated for assets of like type, quality, and quantity in a particular market where the price or compensation has not been determined in any manner that takes into account the volume or value of anticipated or actual referrals. That's the definition for purposes of Stark. The anti-kickback statute does not have an express uh, definition. But in different advisory opinions and other guidance that the government has issued, they kind of outlined the parameters. Um, in that 1992 letter, they specifically said that traditional or common methods of economic valuation do not comport with its prescriptions of the anti-kickback statute. Items ordinarily considered in determining fair market value may be expressly barred by the kickback statute's prohibition against payments for referrals. What does that mean? Again, when you're talking about anti-kickback violations or anti-kickback valuations like Stark, you need to not take into account the, the volume or value of those referrals. Merely because another buyer may be willing to pay a particular price is not sufficient to render the price paid to be fair market value. The fact that a buyer in a position to benefit from referrals is willing to pay a particular price may only be a reflection of the value of the referral stream that is likely to result from the purchase, i.e., most likely a violation of the anti-kickback statute. Accordingly, when attempting to assess fair market value, as that term is used under the anti-kickback statute, attributable to the physician's practice, it may be necessary to exclude from consideration any amounts which reflect, facilitate, or otherwise relate to the continuing treatment of the former practice's patients. Keith's going to talk more about that, so I'm not going to go into that in a great deal of detail. I would note, however, that in that 1992 letter, the government expressed concerns that certain items that are typically you might see in the sale of a, another practice or, or another business outside of the healthcare context, in 1992, the OIG said, hey, we have concerns about some of these situations, and maybe that's just disguised payment for referrals, including portioning significant value to things like goodwill, payment of an ongoing business unit, payment for covenants not to compute, exclusive dealing, and so forth. Um, Keith and I had a discussion before our presentation started about whether or not this 1992 letter is still in force. I think a lot of times evaluators have become comfortable that, that you can probably ascribe some value to these things, but that 1992 letter has never been withdrawn. It's out there. there. You need to make sure that your evaluators understand the potential risks and the, the penalties that are associated. 
Uh, something that's relevant in maybe some of the more recent cases where the government has gone after uh, hospitals or other entities because of sweetheart deals with physicians, in that 1992 letter, the government said, we believe a very revealing inquiry would be to compare the financial welfare of the physicians involved before and after the acquisition. If the economic position of these physicians is expected to significantly improve as a result of the acquisition, hey, that may be a red flag. Mm -hmm. And you've seen that in some of the, the court cases that have come down in uh, some of those recent decisions. Well, what are some common valuation methods when it comes to the purchase or sell of particularly the acquisition, but also items or services? Well, certainly you could look at comparables. Of course, it may be difficult to define comparables if you're talking about the acquisition of a, of a practice because each practice is unique. You could do an internal assessment uh, valuation, but the government has frankly said that those are suspect. We don't like internal valuations because they're not necessarily objective. Then you could uh, go to an outside valuation firm, and quite frankly, that's my default. I'm an attorney. I'm not a practice valuator, so I don't give fair market value opinions. So if it's a significant acquisition or the acquisition of a, of a uh, physician practice, I usually call on somebody like Keith to do an outside valuation. Those valuators may use a combination or uh, different types of valuation methodology, whether it's cost approach, market approach, income approach. Keith can address more of those things when it comes up to his turn. All right, what about leases for space or equipment? Again, Stark has a safe harbor if you want to do a lease for space or equipment, but you generally have to pay fair market value. It has to be commercially reasonable. Similarly, anti-kickback statute has a safe harbor, but again, it has to be fair market value and commercially reasonable. Stark defines fair market value in the context of a lease for space or equipment as the value of rental property for general commercial purposes, not taking into account its intended use. Note, that that's the, volume, the value of rental property for commercial general purposes. They generally don't want you to value a medical practice, a lease of a medical practice, differently because they think that maybe that would open the door to valuing uh, based on referral patterns rather than the actual space or equipment. So the general rule is you have to value the rental property for general commercial purpose, not taken into account its intended use. In the case of a lease of space, this value may not be adjusted to reflect the additional value the prospective lessee or lessor would attribute to their proximity or convenience to the lesser when the lesser is a potential source of patient referrals to the lessee. So if you are, for example, a uh, physical therapy group, you want to be in the same building as a um, as a, an orthopedic services because you want to get all the referrals. You don't want to be in a situation where you're overpaying for that lease. You're ascribing a greater value to that lease benefit, that lease rent, because of uh, your proximity to that potential referral source. For purposes of this definition, a rental payment does not take into account intended use if it takes into account costs incurred by the lesser in developing or upgrading the property or maintaining the property or its improvements. Well, what about the anti-kickback statute? It does contain definitions for purposes of leases. In the case of a lease of space, the anti-kickback statute says that fair market value is the value of rental property for general commercial purposes, but should not be adjusted to reflect the additional value that one party, either the lessee or the lessor, would attribute to the property as a result of its proximity or convenience to the sources of referrals for which the payment may be made under federal health care programs, similar to the Stark standard. The equipment uh, safe harbor contains a similar uh, definition of fair market value that just basically applies to equipment. Well, so what are some of the factors you may take into account in, develop, in evaluating fair market value when it comes to leases for space or equipment? Well, certainly you could use comparables, comparable leases in the community, but just make sure that those comparables are valid. They're, they're not skewed because of referral relationships between the entities. Make sure that you're really talking apples to apples. It is comparable when it comes to the, the age, the build out, things like that. And make sure that you take into account what's included in the lease. You know, you've seen one lease and you've seen one lease. Some <laughs> leases, they'll, they'll, you know, they're triple net. They'll include taxes, insurance, utilities. They'll include collateral services, facilities, those types of things. So make sure that if you are going to use comparables, that you're comparing to a lease that has the same types of services. If your lease is going to include those types of services, make sure that those services, the fair market value for those services, are included in the, the rent. Consider the actual needs for the space or equipment. If you're leasing more space than you need from a potential referral source, hey, 
the entry into that lease for more than you need, that could be a way to funnel more money to them in exchange for referrals and could create anti-kickback or stark issues. Whether the lease is for exclusive or non-exclusive use, the frequency of the use, the length of the lease, the cost to the lesser, tenant improvements, all of those are factors that may go into uh, when you're assessing the, the value of that lease. What are some common methodologies for valuing leases? Well, again, comparables in the community, but just make sure that you're comparing apples to apples, that you're looking at valid comparables, not comparables that have been skewed because of referral relationships. You could go to brokers and find out what um, they're charging or what they see in the market. You could use third-party leasing companies. Um, if there aren't comparables out there, I've used sometimes a cost plus reasonable rate of return. If you haven't got comparables, you determine, okay, what is it your cost and what's a reasonable rate of return, either to for construction or to purchase this piece of equipment and then lease it out. Um, or you can use an outside valuation firm. In any of those situations involving fair market value, just remember that fair market value is not a number. Even the government recognizes that fair market value is a range, and it's going to depend upon individual circumstances. The government specifically said you can use any commercially reasonable method to establish fair market value, so you don't have to rely on necessarily a particular person or a particular survey, but you need to make sure that it's it's reputable, it's commercially reasonable. It should be consistent, address specifics of your situation, and it generally exclude comparables who are in a referral relationship. If you're using published services or surveys, it's usually safer if you can stay around the 50% number in there, so long as that 50% number reflects the services that are actually being provided or otherwise is appropriate under the circumstance. In assessing fair market value, the general rule of thumb is that any remuneration flowing between the hospital or other providers and physicians or other referral sources should be at fair market value for actual and necessary items furnished or services rendered based upon the arm's length transaction and should not take into account directly or indirectly the volume or value of any past or future referrals or other business generated between the parties. Among the other materials that I provided to you, I've given you a copy of the 2005 OIG Supplemental Compliance Guidance. In there, they actually list a bunch of very helpful bullet points on helping you assess fair market value in your physician relationships. It could apply to other types of relationships that might implicate the anti-kickback statute. I've included those in um, both the written materials and in the slides. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through those, but it might be a good practice for you to periodically sit down with your contracts, go through those questions, and ask, you know, are we fair market value based on these factors that the government has identified? A couple of other comments. Remember that we've gone through those, those uh, safe harbors that require fair market value. Uh, there are other safe harbors that don't fit, uh, require a fair market value, and as long as you fit within one of those other safe harbors, then you're okay. Just make sure that each of the transactions fits within an applicable safe harbor. Remember also that fair market value, even on those that we went through, is not the only test. There's other factors that you generally need to satisfy. Specifically, the government has said um, that under the anti-kickback statute, um, fair market value itself is not a safe harbor. You can have a, an arrangement that violates the anti-kickback statute even if you're paying fair market value for what you're doing. If you want to be safe under the, uh, the anti-kickback statute, you have to fit within the relevant factors under that, all of the relevant factors in that safe harbor. Just simply paying fair market value does not necessarily mean that an otherwise uh, illegal payment or an arrangement for an illegal purpose is going to protect you under the anti-kickback statute. Among other, those other requirements that you have to satisfy is commercially reasonableness. Commercial reasonableness is not necessarily the same thing as fair market value. Under those statutes, those regulations that we went through, usually they all required not only fair market value, but you also had that the transaction had to be commercially reasonable. That means, at least according to Stark, that an arrangement appears to be a sensible, prudent business agreement from the perspective of the parties involved, even in the absence of any potential referrals. So again, you kind of have to back out the referral stream in evaluating the commercial reasonableness. Arrangements that lose money are suspect. There could be situations if you've got a, a losing proposition that, that are justified. Maybe you're a hospital. You know you need to provide OB services, but not many hospitals make money on their OB services. But in order to be a good community steward, you need to do that. You may be able to justify those and 
in, uh, under certain circumstances. You just need to be able to make sure that there's a commercially reasonable basis for doing that. My goal, if I've got a, if I've got a, a suspect transaction or a large transaction, then I'm usually going to call on somebody like Keith to do an independent valuation. Now, these independent valuators, it's not required. There's nothing that says you must do that, but it's often helpful, especially in the riskier transactions, such as where you're paying compensation that's above 75% of the surveys or a very high comp highly compensated physician, especially if that physician has an existing referral stream, or maybe you're going to acquire the physician practice or assets. Um, not only for regulatory purposes, I usually recommend getting a, a business valuation, and particularly when you're talking about acquiring a practice or taking on a physician group. They can also help you from a business perspective to evaluate, hey, is this a good business decision for you to make? Or are you going to be losing money in the long run? It can also help you manage physician expectations. The physicians, if you're acquiring their practice, they always think that their practice is worth millions of dollars. And sometimes if you get a qualified business evaluator, they can come in and explain to them, no, your business really isn't worth that much. And so it can help bring them back to the realm of the region. The reason. I remember under the IRS, if you're a 501c3 entity, if you uh, engage an outside evaluator that helps support a, re a rebuttable presumption that you're paying um, fair market value and you can avoid intermediate sanctions. But even if you use a business evaluator, there is no guarantee. In a lot of those cases I mentioned at the beginning, they had business evaluators that the government came back and said for one reason or another, they didn't agree with it. Make sure if you are going to use an independent evaluator, that that evaluator understands the specific requirements with Stark and the anti-kickback statute. Keith Pinkerton is one who does understand that, and so I'm going to turn the time over to Keith and let him talk more about uh, what you need to look for in valuation situations. Well, thank you very much, Kim. I appreciate that. And, you know, I just want to uh, th thank Holland and Hart for providing this venue. And I want to thank all of you that are online for, for taking your valuable time to listen to this. Um, you know, I, I think Kim made some very good points, and I want to, to, to try to give you some good takeaways, too. Uh, you know, it, it, this is the sort of... Uh, of activity that you really don't may may not appreciate the importance of doing this right until well after the fact uh, when when something bad uh, could potentially happen. Uh, so uh, you know, by the way, uh, I just want to mention here that uh, I'm going to offer a bunch of opinions, and so those are my opinions. Uh, it, I'd love to be able to say that that you you are unreasonable if you disagree with my opinion, but that's not necessarily the case. Reasonable pe people may disagree. However, it is important to note that every fair market value opinion is just that. It's an opinion. And the process and the documentation surrounding that opinion uh, is what's going to be used to help determine whether such a thing was reasonable or not. Um, so here, uh, let's just let's kind of back up here on this slide. Uh, right now, uh, I am uh, valuing a utility excavation company, I'm valuing a restaurant, and I'm valuing a pharmacy. Uh, I, I am what you might call a valuation generalist. Uh, the importance of this slide is that with regard, you know, I spend most of my time talking uh, to clients and recommending that they get a, uh, a valuation professional rather than an industry professional. Now, where that, where that, where that's different and the importance of this slide is that healthcare is a little bit of a different animal. Clearly, a medical practice is different for valuation purposes. It's most unique in, in the context of the slide because of a couple of different things. Let's look here. Uh, if I'm the owner of a restaurant, I don't have this regulatory maze, and admittedly this is a little bit over the top. This was prepared, as uh, I think, in the office of a congressman uh, at, at some point in time. But, 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 but healthcare is different. It is a very complex organization, uh, a very complex structure, and you need to be really careful that, that, that you do things right. And here's why. And uh, you know, so uh, obviously this is just a free picture off the internet, but this is where you don't want to be. This is why you want to make sure that your your uh, your uh, fair market value determinations are indeed well documented. Okay, so 
Let's talk about a little bit. Um, there are times when you might need to go outside of a business appraiser. If there's a real property interest or there's a particular piece of very expensive equipment, you might need a machinery and equipment guy or a real estate guy, uh, but, but you want to match the professionals to the job. Make sure you've got somebody who knows the, the parameters of what they're doing, which, by the way, I, you know, um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today, kind of what, what I'm going to talk about specifically, kind of edges on the, on the bounds of the law. You don't want to, to take legal advice from me unless you're fond of orange jumpsuits. Uh, and, and I say that tongue in cheek, but you want to consult with, with somebody like Kim, uh, you know, that, as a general proposition that, you know, the types of projects that I work on in this field, I usually have an attorney right by my side ta telling me what the legal aspects of that are. But match the professional to the job. Um, so, what you're going to, as we kind of already talked about, fair market value is an opinion. Uh, in most states, business valuation is not government regulated. That means if I could convince you, if I could come right out of high school and convince you uh, to hire me, to give, to give me your money, uh, I could be a business appraiser. And um, that's a little over the top, but it, it is the case that there are people that are practicing business valuation, because remember, they're rendering an opinion that may not have the appropriate uh, qualifications or training. So here are four, there are four common uh, business valuation credentials in the industry. There's also a fifth that, that's uh, the certified business appraiser, and that's kind of going away. There have been some issues there, but, but you look for these sorts of credentials to give you, uh, maybe perhaps give you some assurance of who it is that, that's going to be rendering the opinion. Now that said, the, depending upon who the appraiser is, the appraiser that is selected is what drives the selection of the standards. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, there are many people that, that do this sort of work, that, that perform business appraisals, that uh, don't have any applicable regulation standing behind them. And, and this is not to pick on somebody that's an economist or financial analyst or a business broker, but you have many people who can offer, who do offer valuation opinions that they may follow business valuation standards, but they don't have to. So if you get someone who has the ASA, the, uh, the CPA, ABV, or the CVA, at least you, you have a, some sort of baseline that you know that they're going to follow. Now, how does that manifest itself? And I know that, that you know, you're never, well, probably never going to become experts in valuation theory. You don't have to. Uh, but you need to know a few things. Here's one of those things. If you retain a, uh, someone who is a, an ASA, they might call something a calculation. That does, that's a term of art under the ASA business valuation standards. It may not be the same re reference. In fact, uh, the AICPA business valuation standards have a different definition for calculations. In, in, uh, under the AICPA standards, if you hire someone to retain a calculation, they cannot render a, a, an opinion, a conclusion of value. What they're giving you is a calculated value, which is basically arithmetic. So uh, now that said, you just need to be a little bit careful about you know who you're retaining, what standards they're going to follow. The standards kind of give you some, should give you some level of comfort that things are being done properly. Off to the right of this slide is something called USPAP. Uh, that is the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. Uh, if you hire an ASA, they're required to follow USPAP. One of the requirements of USPAP is every time I open up a file, I have to uh, keep all the records that are necessary to generate a full-blown appraisal report at any point in time in the future. Now, that doesn't mean I have to write an appraisal report, but I have to be able to generate it. Why is that important? Because in these sorts of, of in this regulatory class, climate, you may not get challenged on a fair market value determine, determination until several years after the fact. You need to make certain that you have the proper records on hand as well as you, you, you'd really, ideally you'd like to have your appraiser have those records too. Now, please don't take 
from this that you shouldn't hire a, a CPA or a member of AICPA because CPAs, uh, having worked for three CPA firms, they are really good at keeping records and most of them are going to keep what's necessary in the file anyways. Uh, what you don't want to do is find yourself six years down the road and not have enough information in a file to back up the decision that you made. That is n no real cover whatsoever. So let's just kind of keep moving on here. Um, let's talk a little bit here about practice valuations. And I'm going to try to, to cover those, the practice valuations, the professional service agreements, and the lease agreements. Uh, that's really where you're going to find most of the business appraisers doing their, their work here. Um, but the practice valuation uh, must be conducted without the consideration of referrals, as Kim went through. Um, you know, at, at length there, you, you just cannot value the practice as if, uh, you know, uh, you know, those referrals were, were of any value. And you really have to consider all elements of the transaction. Now here I've got two examples, and this is uh, an, an issue where you often have an education element where you might want to talk to, to if you're talking about buying a, a physician's practice, you might want to make sure you, you mention this to the physician because sometimes they, they will not understand. Um, if, you're, if you're going to buy a practice, most often people don't buy cash. Uh, a, dollar's worth, a dollar of cash is worth a dollar, and that's usually true everywhere and always. Um, so if cash doesn't transfer, then the value shouldn't include cash. That means the, the entity or the, the, uh, what you are valuing should not include the cash. What I say, when I say mention this to the physician, uh, if you subtract out cash, and in particular if you're going to subtract out cash in AR, if, you're, if that's not going to be purchased, once you subtract that out, you might have quite a bit different purchase price or proposed fair market value than if it were going to transfer. And so you have to, to kind of make sure that, that both parties understand the seller is going to retain that asset. And that's an issue of going through and making sure that, that what's going to be purchased is actually lining up with what you're valuing. Uh, similarly, if, if you're going to, if, if a physician is going to become an employee after the transaction, you need to make sure that that document, the, the employment agreement, takes into account those terms, or if not, that the terms are within FMV or fair market value bounds. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, we, we've been asked to value practice and we will not have an employment agreement. We'll certainly want to get a draft and we'll certainly want to talk about in the report, this assumes that any employment agreement subsequently entered into is going to be on fair market value terms. Okay, that's just important to make sure those things line up. So when you hire an appraiser uh, you, or, or uh, if you hire an appraiser here, you, you want to attempt to consider all three approaches to valuation. Uh, there's something called a market approach that's looking at uh, other assets of like type for which we can determine a value. There's an income approach. It's driven by cash flow. And there's an, an asset approach. It's driven by what you own and what you owe. So let's take a look at each one of those elements real quick like here. Um, here here's a market approach. This is an example. Uh, there are a number of different data sources you can go look to to find uh, historic transactions for particular types of practices. Here's some uh, physician practices that came out of a particular database. But, you know, the real problem you have here is that things change over time. And so in order to get a large sample of transactions, I may have to go back quite a bit in time. Is it relevant to buying a practice after the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is signed uh, to, to, com to compare to a, a transaction that occurred before that? Maybe, but you might need to make some adjustments to that. And so the real, the real issue, here, and, and similarly as shown on this slide, you might have some, uh, some issues with uh, electronic medical, electronic health record payments. And so you might need to make some adjustments to the data. And the, the real problem with these approaches is for the, the private transactions, you really don't have much in the way of good information. You might know about the EBITDA or the net revenues for the practice for one period of time, but you don't know whether what the trend was, whether that was good, bad, or indifferent. You just don't know. So, so the market approach is somewhat interesting in healthcare. Uh, in, in another element of the market approach, we often look to publicly traded companies. In the healthcare space, there's, you know, that's a moving target. There's been so much 
uh, consolidation and, and companies moving in and, and, and moving out of that space. And in fact, there's not a lot of what you call a pure play. Um, and my, my best example of that is in the home health care space. We might look to, uh, there's a, a, a publicly traded company called KeyMed Corporation, and you might want to look to KeyMed to help you understand the, the valuation multiples that are on home health companies. KeyMed also owns another, it has two divisions, a home health hospice is one, and the second is that they own the Rotor Rooter Company. And, you know, you, you don't have what's called a pure play here. You've got two different business, businesses operating under one. And, and unfortunately, the, the, the data quality for the publicly traded uh, healthcare uh, companies just kind of it's just a little bit lacking in terms of uh, the ability to make good comparisons. But you should, uh, a properly crafted appraisal should try to, to look at that. So let's talk about income. Uh, here's a, this uh, is a generally accepted formula for valuation uh, for a one one particular valuation model in particular, and, and it shows that value is a function of three variables. It's value. Uh, it's a function of cash flow, risk, and growth. And so the arrows here are uh, help are supposed to help you understand what might drive value. If you want to, if to the extent that this model makes sense. And I think it often does. If you want to increase value, you can do that one of three ways. You can inc increase cash flow, or you can decrease risk, or you can increase growth. Those three changes or any combination thereof will it tend to increase value. Now, the real problem here is that... Uh, changing one element might impact the others. And I just want to throw out there for your consideration, if you have, uh, you're, you're doing business, uh, you're, you've got a company, you're doing business, you have uh, four or five different vendors that you're buying one particular product from, uh, you might be able to save money by consolidating those vendors into one and thereby, by saving money, increase your cash flow, in theory, raising value. But what happens it, by, it, by making that change? Have you increased the risk profile by getting rid of other, other vendors? If you have, it might actually be a wash. So we need to, to look at those three elements, and a proper appraisal will look at those, all those independently in detail. Now, one of the problems in, in a healthcare situation is that often uh, when you take collections minus practice expenses and overhead, what's left is provider compensation. Uh, this may be true even when normalized. If that's true, if all that's left is provider compensation, you really can't use an income approach because there's no income to capitalize. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to divorce the practice's earnings from the earnings of the doctors or providers for, that are putting the labor in. And so what does that leave you with? And this is often where you end up. It, it leaves you with an asset approach. Now, here's just kind of a, a screenshot from a, a typical asset approach. I've drawn a big red circle around intangible assets in the middle. Uh, the reason that I want to draw your attention to this uh, is that often the asset approach can be lower than uh, part, particular parties to a transaction may believe that, that the value should be. Uh, the two main errors, uh, there's two errors that can happen with the intangibles. They're either ignored, uh, either the appraiser doesn't pick them up at all, or they can be grossly inflated. And you want to avoid both of those aspects. So let me take you to, to how that number was generated in a particular assignment and just kind of show you a little bit of how that looks like. So this particular schedule here was the derivation of the, the $233,000 number that's on there. And what, you, what an appraiser really wants to do is wants to identify things that aren't on the books. You know, if, if a particular practice has trade names, logos, or graphics, those aren't going to be on a balance sheet anywhere. Uh, the value of the website is probably not going to be capitalized. There's going to be a bunch of things that aren't on the books. And the appraiser's job is to identify those and quantify them. The one thing that, that I'll draw your attention to uh, is trained and assembled workforce. And this is the thing that, that, that really um, is, I think, an, an area that's ripe for, for problems. Um, Depending upon your situation, you may have a very expensive asset in terms of your trained and assembled workforce. Uh, 
But you need to consider the marketplace for providers and, and how difficult they are to recruit and what the costs of recruiting and training those are. Uh, I often see very, very large numbers here, and they just kind of make me nervous. I, I think if you have a big number in there for training and assemble workforce and you can't back it up, that, that's kind of problematic. And also here, I've left out the customer list and relationship. There are a couple ways to go at, at, at skinning that cat where you might be able to quantify those customer lists and relationship. But if you have no income left over and so you're passing on an income approach, uh, you have to kind of question how much value is there. And it's, I think it's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit problematic if you don't do that very thoroughly. But, but clearly the, the, the NAS approach is something that's used when you don't have income or market data. And I think you want to look for an appraisal that covers all three legs. You, you want to have all three elements at least thought through very carefully. So let's move on here a little bit. Uh, let's talk about professional service agreements. Um, so I I'm, wasn't necessarily intending to plug uh, plug the competition here, if you will. But finally, we are having professional literature developed. Uh, I think it was 2006 or 2007, uh, somewhere around there when healthcare valuation uh, came out. Uh, uh, that is a really good addition to your library if you are involved at all in, in fair market value oversight. Uh, nice book. And then uh, clearly the second one is a good book as well. Uh, both are good additions, but I will tell you the, the important thing about it is that now we're starting to have a growing consensus in the industry on how you value these things. Uh, for you know the early part of the 2000s, it just really wasn't much you could rely upon, and, and everything was kind of a crapshoot, so to speak. Here we've got some some uh, coalescing around certain ideas is generally accepted, and that's what I really wanted to bring your attention here. Uh, so with regard to PSAs or the professional service agreements, this is my take, uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek take on it. There are two principles, and this is not meant to be a Make America Great reference, but there's the American flag. It's still a free country. You can pay what you want in terms of compensation. You just need to make sure it's equivalent to fair market value and document that. The second is a, a, a chart that I hope comes through a lot clearer on your, uh, from your perspective, is that there's, there should be a relationship between work and compensation. When you work more, you should be able to get more money. Uh, generally, that is the way it goes, and, and those two things are still operative here. So let's take kind of a little bit deeper look at these PSAs. Uh, often... Um, as, as Kim mentioned, people look to salary surveys uh, to, to um, confirm the fair market value that is paid. But does the same salary survey apply to L in, in L.A. as it does to, uh, in, let's call it Bangor, Maine, up there? Uh, probably not. Now, the one thing I'll tell you is economists, and I can say this because my undergrad's economics uh, degree, uh, economists are notoriously bad at measuring cost of living from one market to another. Uh, a lot of the salary surveys, an MGMA survey is nationwide. So you need to be careful when you start to make comparisons. Certainly if you're in Hawaii or Bangor, Maine or L.A., the costs are different. And so there's a concept that comes to you. Let's go to the next slide. There's a concept in economics that's called relevant geographic market, and that's what's operative here. A comprehensive compensation analysis has got to include all the elements of the relevant geographic market. The market for physician or for a particular physician or provider in Bangor, Maine may not look the same as it does in LA. So you want to look at competition, cost of living, supply and demand, the desirability of the area, and that includes a lot of things. Taxation, mobility of labor, there's a whole bunch of things that have to go into that determination that you want to look at. So salary survey is a great place to start, but you really need to drill down and say, okay, what is, what's really going on here? And you want to, again, as Kim mentioned, uh, I, you, you really want to make certain that the terms of the contract are what you're valuing. If you're calling in that contract, if you're calling for a minimum work schedule of three hours a week, you probably don't want to be, be comparing that to somebody who's at the 90th percentile of work RVUs. You want to make sure those things are aligned, and that's what's going to help provide a, a, a good uh, indication of fair market value. So uh, here's just a little, little bit 
what I was talking about earlier, um, you know, if you've got a, comp, a compensation formula that talks about uh, so many dollars per work RVU, great. I don't think that's a problem at all. Let's look at the next slide. Here's where you might want to be concerned, and none of this is necessarily forbidden or prohibited or off limits, but you need to be concerned with if there's a bubble or something in the formula where it might look like you're steering rewards to a particular group of physicians, because that's what's going to cause uh, in a particular potentially regulatory scrutiny here is when you might have some sort of issue with, with that. And so you want to have things that, it, now I'm not suggesting that it can't look like this if it does, but the more it looks unusual, the more effort you should put into compliance, making sure that you've got those files documented to make, you know, because, you know, four or five years down the road, you do not want to have to defend something that might look like this if there's not a reason for it, okay? All right, uh, so we talk, talk a little bit about le uh, leasing arrangements. What's the fair market value of a loaf of bread? Obviously, this is completely made up numbers. I have no idea what, what the loaf of bread goes for in, in New York City. But I, I guarantee you here in Boise, Idaho, I can go into an Albertsons and pay one price, and I can go uh, to Walmart and pay another price, or I can go to a convenience store and pay a third. Uh, what Kim was mentioning is, is you really need to be careful uh, when you, what you're considering in a leasing arrangement. So if you're considering convenience, I think that just ought to be a red flag go up. And, and really, are, is, is that influencing, how much is that influencing the fair market value determination? So, so let's talk just a little bit, and I know I'm kind of running, running you all a little bit late in time. Uh, the lease terms, uh, really, they, they may not account for the volume of very, or value of referrals between the parties. The lease terms drive the value. Um, if I have a specific lease, its terms are going to heavily impact what that value is. If there's a bargain purchase for, for a, a very expensive piece of equipment, you can buy it for a dollar at the end of the lease, don't you think that's going to impact fair market value? Yes. Uh, a lease is nothing more than a discounted cash flow valuation. You need to include all those things. You can consider bargain purchases. You can consider tenant improvements. Most market data is triple net lease. If you go out and get a, get a market data, a comparable market uh, lease, now make sure you're, you're adjusting for the proper terms. Be very careful, as I mentioned earlier, regarding convenience and consider local market conditions. Um, if you are a larger entity, in fact, most entities, I think, uh, most entities have leased something, something that may be reasonably similar to to, uh, to use as a comparable. And so if you've got other leases, uh, those are a great source for lease uh, agreements to compare to, but you need to make sure those are fair market value before you rely on them. Uh, cost plus a reasonable rate of return is a great way to go. The real question is what's a reasonable rate of return? Changes all the time. Uh, and you watch the market today, Kim? I am not. No. We, were, we were down over 500 points today. That's what um, I'm and I, and I, I, think it, I think it was starting to come back up. But rates of return change all the time. Uh, need to look at them and have a rational basis for that. You may need real property or an ME specialist, uh, depending upon what the nature of the underlying is. Uh, all those things really need to be considered very carefully. So that kind of brings us to the to where I wanted to, to take you to. I, I will leave you with uh, just a couple couple real quick points. Um, this is to, to reiterate, fair market value is an opinion, uh, and then what do we know about opinions? Everybody's got them. Uh, in another context, if I, you know, I, I do some estate and gift tax work, and, and it causes me to look at tax court opinions. And uh, several years ago, a tax court opinion came out, and it's got a great quote in it, and I, I'm just going to paraphrase, but it says, disputes over fair market value fill our dockets. And that situation, and this has been seven or eight years, I guess, now, and that situation has not changed. It's equally true, if not more so, in healthcare. So I would just caution you to be very careful uh, to to really, really think. Uh, I, I believe the, the onus for compliance is with the entities that are making the transaction. Even if you hire somebody like me, uh, you still got the, the, the regulatory burden that you're responsible for. So, so hire somebody who knows what they're doing. Question them. Make sure their assumptions are reasonable. You have reasonable assumptions coming in, you're going to have a reasonable valuation going out. If you have a series of, of of assumptions or data points, and all those assumptions are skewed one way or another, look out. 
that's a red flag and and certainly on the on the DOJ side or OIG side they if they see that they're going to know what what you know that's going to going to really get their scrutiny so pay attention i know this is not this you know compliance does not result in revenue but your your goal here is to avoid the problem before it happens and once again uh you know don't don't misconstrue anything i said for legal advice turn to a guy like kim for it otherwise you're in trouble so thanks for your time i really appreciate it thanks so much keith just wrapping up here, uh, if you want additional resources, the government's got a great website uh, that talks about the fraud and abuse issues. We've given you a lot of the publications that they've come out with specifically dealing with uh, fair market value in certain contexts. Uh, if you have further questions, you can certainly uh, check our website. We've got a bunch of resources there about Stark and Anna Kickback that they're all free. The cost is right. Yep. We don't have to be worried about uh, charging fair market value. We can give freebies. Uh, <laughs> Other than that, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me and or Keith, and we'd be happy to answer questions offline. Hope you have a good day. Thank you.